I'm here in Wallhaus in Germany at the site of the first 3D printed apartment building in Europe. They've rented out four of the five units and one unit will remain empty as a showcase so that guests can take a look at what a 3D printed apartment building might look like. This project is a commercially viable project built by Perry using their Kobod Bode 2 3D printer. Perry was responsible for all of the research and development when it came to implementing this particular design for this building. We're going to take a look at all of the different features with Fabian, an engineer from Perry, along with Sebastian, a co-owner of Root, the construction company that built and owns this building. Hello, my name is Sebastian Rook. I am one of the founders of the first 3D printed construction company in Germany, called Gebäudedruck. And uh, we built together with our partner, Perry, the first multi-family house in Germany. My name is Fabian Meibrutz and I am responsible for all the three printing activities at Perry. Perry, we are one of the largest manufacturers of former scaffolding solutions worldwide and we are very happy to be here in this uh, very amazing building. So in this building we've uh, decided, like most other 3D printed buildings out there, to keep the facade uh, visual and exposed to kind of show off that it's a 3D printed structure. We can see the expansion joint that we've included here in this building as well because the shrinkage and thermal expansion needs to be incorporated like with any traditional concrete structure. So you can see that we've printed um, parts of the, the third story at a certain point in time as winter and snow hit us. We, we stopped the printing and continued with the rest so conventionally. The facade carries itself and the wind load. Yeah. So definitely it was part of our permitting process to make sure that the facade is, okay. is proof. Um, so you can't just, in Germany, you can't just print a facade even if it's non-load bearing. Yeah. You still have to go undergo uh, testing for this. And this is what we did here, but the facade itself is not structural. But together with the material from Heidelberg, we had to do quite a lot of testing in the printed form. And not just small samples that we had to test for compression or flexural strength, um, but really whole wall elements, so 8 feet by 8 feet wall elements that we had to do uh, three-point bending tests, we had to test the facade elements, we had to test for freezing and thawing. So quite a lot of testing which is now luckily copy and pasteable to other buildings that we will do. That process of testing it was rather straightforward down at, uh, towards the end to get the building permit. It's called uh, permitting in individual cases in Germany. You have to have a third party evaluator, so an expert who writes a report that the structural concept of the building actually is fitting to the testing that we did. This process for the permitting in individual cases is actually rather well known, but you still have to apply it to the specific construction technique where not just the material is new, but also the building method is new. Here in Germany we have a very high standard in terms of the way we build. The building codes are one of the toughest uh, across the globe, maybe maybe second to Japan. We're very proud to have been able to do this. We could have chosen a country where it's a bit easier, uh, but we decided we can get it to work here, we can get it to work all across the globe and that has a much more significant signal to the construction industry that this is a viable technology, that it's not just a weird demo building. People will live here, it's not just that people can live here, but they actually will move in in a month and it's a fully permitted real-world building and not just a demo project. This would conventionally be a masonry structure here in this region in Germany, which doesn't have any rebar involved either, so it's just a compression-only structure. And the same is true for this one. So there's uh, only rebar in the slab level, but there's no rebar in all the vertical elements. It's unreinforced concrete according to the norms. In a hurricane or storm, how would you expect this house to hold up compared to the other homes in this region? This will not go anywhere. We've made sure of that with all the testing that we did. The safety of the human beings who live in this building has utmost uh, priority. Nothing will happen to this building in, in decades. How has the building been, uh, and the project been received by the local community? Have you got the, a lot of positive feedback on it? Have people... in, in general, we got quite a lot of good feedback in, across the, the board from uh, locals as well as from contractors, planners, precast plans, you name it. We had expected a lot more negative feedback as well. That somebody feels, come on, what are these guys doing over here? But we felt that majority we received very good feedback with the technology and its potential. So you can see how we, we replaced um, the Z-axis uh, for the printer. They were mounted on a couple of concrete uh, pads. So the concrete pads were removed at a later point in time. We 
had to put a little bit of concrete underneath because everything was dug out because of the basement. It's gonna be either removed or covered with um, earth. If you come around, you can see here the other footing. So you can see that in total we have three uh, Z axes on each side. So three axes here and three axes on the other building. In this case, um, the BOT2 printer that we used uh, was seven modules long, um, so 17 and a half meters. It was four modules high, um, so together with the feet we had a print volume of about 9.5 meters as a, as a print volume. Um, the printer itself is, is 10 meters tall. The basement was fully constructed before we set up the printer. This building is comprised of five apartments, so two on each of the first story and the second story, and one on the very top story. This one will not be rented out, it's what we will call the showroom. Uh, we have it ready to show to our clients. For all the other apartments, all the lease contracts have been signed and people are going to be moving in in about a month. Now we are staying in the living room. Uh, we have one uh, exposed wall, so we can see the, the 3D printed wall. Uh, I capture at this apartment. There we have the kitchen. So one of the upsides of the 3D printing technology is that you can integrate quite a few other trades directly into the print process. So all the openings for the power outlets were included directly in the, into the print, so nobody had to drill any holes or cut any slots in this. Um, we did decide though to leave, for example, the, the, the pipes for the water um, exposed if you want to reach them quickly. For the most part in this building, uh, we decided to plaster the walls um, to make it visually more appealing. I think that if you might actually go a little crazy if all the walls would have the layer structure. We will then insert the doors for the whole structure and the lintels on top of the doors were placed manually. In this case, um, the lintel level is actually the slab. It was a very conventional plastering process. It did take a little bit more material because of the very articulated layer structure that we wanted to have because we wanted to show off, for example, on this wall what the 3D printed structure looked like. So in the walls that we had to plaster, there was a little bit of a downside because we did need more material. Down the road, we will definitely see um, that we will be able to smoothen um, the, the 3 d printed layer structure and down the road it will be a normal conventional plastering process. Um, actually, you might need a little less plastering because a slightly articulated layer structure will lead to the plaster sticking better to the wall. This project is clearly still under construction. So make sure you appreciate that they're letting us tour through this building in its unfinished state. I happen to be here now, so they've been very kind to open their doors and let me film this before they complete all of the finishing touches. I'm very confident Root Contracting knows what they're doing, and when this project is finished, it's going to be a very aesthetically pleasing building to live in. And the residents can take pride in knowing they're part of the construction revolution. This is where we enter the, the apartment. Then we come to the bathroom over here, which is mostly done, but all the tiles are placed. Um, all the water installations are done. We're just uh, missing out the shower. Here to the left side, this is the bedroom of these uh, two room apart, but there again we left one of the three printed walls exposed. So you will actually put a little bit of a frame around that exposed wall to highlight that kind of um, eye catcher um, of this, this feature in the building. You save some money, you don't have to put a picture on the wall there. Okay, it is a one bedroom apartment which has a bigger um, living slash dining room kitchen, a bathroom and, and one bedroom. First floor and in the second floor there's two of each apartments that all basically look the same. The very top floor where we have a three bedroom apartment. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the other apartments and we'll also go to see um, in the very top floor, we'll see the loft. Once everything is said and done and everything is installed, it's actually a little less exciting. But I mean, again, you can see, you can see that the, the basement is conventional, as I mentioned, right? And here you can see basically the exact same layout. And you have the, the bathroom, which is already completely done. Here you have the master bedroom and um, here on my right hand side we again have the living, dining and kitchen area where we in this case let a different part of the wall exposed. This apartment will be rented. The rent in this building is the lower end of what would you pay for a structure like this in this area. So we're trying to adhere to the, to the local people here and also it was uh, first only shown to local people to move in and uh, not to people that came from afar. 
I mean, we're in a small, uh, almost village called Badenhausen. This building here is situated right next to the little town square and the church that we have here. So from an architectural standpoint, we had to make sure that it fits into this rather traditional village. Hence, we used a combination of wood and concrete on the outside. And we also have um, tried to ensure the roof structure of the gable roof is, is very traditional in this area. There's a pipe going through the wall. Uh, that's, I assume it's a ventilation pipe? Yes, it's a ventilation pipe. And it will be just be attached to the fan? It's a normal ventilation system and will have a fan attached to make sure that the air moves the right way. And what's the geometry? Um, designed into the SCL or, or a print file or I have this been manually carved out? We try to ensure that all the openings are included in the design of the building and the 3D model already. There is manual labor still involved in 3D printing a building for sure. But yes, we also are aiming to reduce the amount of labor needed in a structure. But bottom line, we are trying to support the trades that go into this. So we are trying to get young people excited about working on a construction site again. Mm -hmm. From our point of view, there will always be manual labor. Um, the human is a brilliant machine and it's exceedingly flexible. And quite a few of the tasks that you put in here would be very difficult or very expensive to automate. And for example, the placement of the wall binders in this building, it's very fast, very simple, can be done simultaneously with the print. Feel free to walk in left and right, but again, it's basically all the same as we've just seen. We're now in the second floor of the building, where there's two more units, pretty much identical to the two on the first floor. Let's take a quick look. Now we're in the bathroom. Here's where the shower will be. And then behind me, this is presumably where they'll have the toilet and then the sink over there. As opposed to the show unit, this one features a smaller accent wall. Like I mentioned, these units are already rented, so no matter how bad you want to live in here, somebody else beats you to it. Here's the other unit on the second floor. I'm really sorry about the audio. Because there's no carpet or any kind of fabric, there's a ton of reverb, and you're gonna have to forgive me for that until I buy a better microphone. If you have any suggestions for what kind of equipment would be useful for rooms that have high reverb, let me know in the comments. I'll go upstairs one more. This building was printed in the winter. Winter came a little too early for us, so it was starting to snow like crazy every day. We had freezing temperatures, and so we did want to get a little further up, like about two or three feet more, but we had to stop a little early. We actually integrated conventional construction together with the old construction method, which also worked beautifully. One story in this building was done in exactly seven print days, so we had seven sections vertically that we printed here. The rooms are 2.7-ish something in meters tall, about 40 centimeters per section. We had to section it up because of the layer time of the material. Right now there's simply one material we can use in Germany that's permitted. Uh, in this case it's from, from Heidelberg, the iTech material. We will surely see more materials out there, some for smaller structures, some for bigger, and we definitely would have needed a material that is suitable for a bigger structure with longer layer times. We are in the, uh, in the loft, basically, where again we have a bathroom over here. Then we can enter one of the bedrooms. As everything, also the doors are already installed and all the power outlets are there. Here we, we don't really see the three printed structure anymore. So this could almost be like a conventional building. You don't really see the difference. The roof construction in this case is conventionally a wooden roof like we would do it with any other building. The living and, and dining area that we have here. So here we're gonna place uh, the kitchen. It's the largest of the apartments that we have in the, in the building. Also, of course, with the best view, you can't actually tell that it's a 3D printed structure at this point in time. You will see it on the outside, of course, because that's where we decided to keep the facade visual exposed. But here you basically can't tell. We have considered it and continuously do consider to print also slab and roof structures. Um, but at least for now, so here we have a filigrane deck, so a half-finished precast element that is already produced in big facilities almost automatically. So it's very difficult to um, generate the economic value. And in these structures, it was very important to us that we print what makes sense in the overall construction process and not simply print something just because we can. All the heating is installed in the slab. The ventilation is not installed in the slab in this case. We were actually extremely proud that we managed to print in freezing conditions. It's probably a world's first because it was snowing um, on top of what we've printed and it was still all right. And it just kept on snowing and snowing. We were simply done. Um, which is 
live and you would do it conventionally here in this region when it snows then you're done it just it doesn't matter which type of technology you're using to execute the structure one of the key reasons is you need running water to operate the printer to do your mixing and if all your hoses uh, continuously clock up overnight you always have to basically thaw the hoses and it's just way too much effort in, in, in that point in time so it has all to do about the periphery of the printing and the machinery and then we always print it up maybe three to four feet and then the next section and then the next and then we so went back around. Feet. The best we've achieved is one section up to two meters in one day. So we improved the speed of the printing process during also learning curve in one building and the sort of bottom of the ground floor was three sections and the second story then was two sections only. Here, if you, if you are in autumn, it's very cold in the morning, it gets warm during uh, lunchtime, and then to always keep everything stable um, to achieve a nice layer structure, that's definitely a challenge. And the bigger you get, the more tolerances, of course, you also have in a big machinery when it's uh, being hit by wind, etc. We are extremely proud of what we've achieved this time around. If we do it two, three, four more times, it will be a lot faster and a lot um, cheaper in the future. But there's definitely still a learning curve that we all have to undergo, which we will do together with, with contractors who now specialize on delivering 3D printed buildings to homeowners. Um, and we in the background with our knowledge about 3D printing. Um, together then, of course, with the machine itself. We did, when at the end of the print day, always cover up the printed structure to support the hydration process. As Mühlich, Fink and Partner was the architect of this project. It's an architectural firm uh, local here to in the town of Ulm that's uh, not too far away. So the future has already started for this. Uh, we are going to be executing more projects also this year. I can't really get any there, there yet because the... Go. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Yeah, The, screws, uh, the floor was just installed. Uh, so this building has a conventional basement. Um, the printed structure starts on top of the uh, slab level of the basement. What challenges come with that? Conventional wall assembly simply looks uh, a lot, uh, this is very different in terms of where insulation is placed and you have to find that intersection between three printed wall assembly and basement to create a continuous insulation level along the whole building. And so that definitely leads to a couple of, of challenges that we had to solve, but we found together as a team, we found very good solutions for this. The apartment gets a storage room, and then there's also the, the central heating is in one of the rooms here in the basement. Um, and we've used the conventional peri formwork to do the concreting for the basement in this case. So again, it's kind of the combination of um, conventional construction, make where it makes sense because of the water permeability issue, uh, combined with the new construction. Slab and walls were poured at the same time in this case to make the concreting as efficient as we could. This is the boiler room that we're in now to um, uh, provide the heating for this, this structure. This building um, is, is attached to a uh, gas processing plant that uses um, cow dung to create the energy, so we have a very sustainable energy source in this building and it's also produced very locally, just uh, a mile uh, away from the building. The important thing, our building needs uh, only 55% energy consumption compared to a uh, normal building. So the labor shortage is, is definitely a huge issue um, in, in Germany, but I, uh, across the world as well. It's definitely very important that we can reduce the amount of labor needed, but it's at least similar important that we get young people excited to work on construction sites again. Uh, and this is what we are targeting with this technology to a large extent. Printing makes working on construction more attractive and less taxing on the body. 3D printing will be the breakthrough for automation in construction. I have experience in the conventional uh, small scale uh, 3D printing and that makes me a lot of fun and uh, I think it's very cool to do that in a much more biggest scale. <laughs> These cracks, how could, how can they be prevented? Do you know what caused this crack specific, specifically? So it's uh, in the end it is concrete, so we definitely will have some some shrinkage and thermal expansion cracking. Um, I think this will also in the future never be quite avoided because mm -hmm. it is concrete as a building material. It is a material that does crack a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, as long as these cracks are not structural and the building physics are designed accordingly, um, that's uh, quite simple as it is. 
if you don't want them you can't and you don't want to see them you can always plaster the building um, at a later point in time like you would normally do it with a masonry structure or a concrete structure the further we go with the technology um, the better we will be with this and create smoother and smoother layers um, from start to finish so obviously this was one of the first buildings we ever executed the first time you try something it's never perfect when you do it a couple of uh, times more it will be better and better we as Perry, we are what's called the, the seed shareholder um, of Cobot in Denmark um, and Cobot has developed the BOT2 machinery that we've used on this printing site. Uh, we've been very active and busy to prove it in the real world um, and also to see how we can come from a printing technology to a construction technology. Um, how do we integrate all the other trades, how do we do the planning process, logistics on site, etc. So it's not just about stacking layers of concrete, there's a whole lot more to 3D printing than just the machine or just the stacking. Uh, and we've always taken a very holistic view on the overall construction process uh, and that's what kept us busy and that's what I think is so remarkable about this building that for example um, all the trades are really integrated into the structure we for example printed the stop and form work um, and not just print the demo house and kind of throw all the other trades in there afterwards but from the beginning on think about how holistically we can think this. So this was obviously a great team effort um, so the team here at Perry, um, Yannick and, and Chikaze and, and Michael to, to just name a few of the guys who've been here on site to make this happen uh, together with our colleagues uh, Sebastian Rupp, Fabian Rupp from uh, the Rupp Contracting Company who've made this project here feasible. Uh, also definitely a big shout out to our friends at MTech because without their silo and their pumping system none of this would have been working.